Well, the Bible is God's holy word, and it's, um, it's our rock and our foundation for uh, living a Christian life. I think as, as a family and with so many children that God has entrusted us with, I know that I can't do it alone. Yeah. And so the partnership with Shoreline, the partnership with our church uh, and Sunday school is really vital to how we stay connected with our children throughout the week. Um, the, you know, I'm a, the parent cue cards, um, that'll be my little plug, but the parent cue cards, we had just we have them. We have them at the kitchen table. Uh, I take a couple from the church and I post them on the door before we go out. Just that really quick reminder um, to bring it up with my children. If you expect them to take the Word of God seriously, you have to set the example that you take the Word of God seriously. The first level of success for my, my children is that they know and love Jesus. And if that becomes my highest priority, I think all things fall into place after that. So we try to create everything to move all of our children in that direction, that knowing and loving Jesus is the first thing in their life. By doing it together, um, you know, we can, I can model that with them as well as feed my own spirit with the Word of God. If the Bible is meant to guide us and it is, it is giving us truth and it is showing us God, and it is our ability to hear from God and to know God, then we have to make that a priority. So, yeah, amen. And, and yes, they have a bus. Um, <laughs> Those are just a beautiful picture. Some of you are going, when's the picture, the line of pictures going to be? When a person, young or old, male or female, grew up in the church, didn't grow up in the church, when a person comes to that point where they say, I need Jesus, I confess my wrongs, I confess my sins, I take the forgiveness of Jesus, and I take the hand of Jesus, and I'm going to walk with him. When a person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, something happens. The spirit of the living God moves into that person. You may not feel it. They may, they're not, they're not going to glow like they're radioactive, but, but the spirit of the living God moves into a person when they put their faith in Jesus. And then, when you have a person in whom dwells the spirit of God, read this book that was inspired by that same spirit of God. Every time a follower of Jesus, filled with the Spirit of God, reads the book inspired by the Spirit of God, and those things come together, something happens. You may not notice it, you may not feel it, but something is happening in your heart and your life if you're a follower of Jesus. And if you're not yet a Christian, and you become a Christian today, or this week, or this month, God's Spirit will move in you, and when you read this book, something will happen. Well, what happens? We talked four weeks ago about sometimes when we read this book, it's as sweet as honey, or delicious as great salsa. You know, when you read this book, it, it, there's times where you just go, mmm, 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 mmm. Oh, it's delicious. It it's satisfies my soul. It brings me comfort, encouragement. Sometimes we read the word and it's just sweet. I love those days when I open God's word and that's what happens. Sometimes we read the same book, the same person reads the same book, filled by the same spirit, and what happens is not mmm, 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 mmm. What happens is, uh oh. And we realize that God's word is like an instruction book. God's, God, God's word shows us how to live, and we've gotten out of alignment. And, and we say, uh-oh, I'm off the path. I'm out of alignment. The good thing is God's word points that out and then brings us back into alignment again. It rebukes and corrects, gets us back into line. Sometimes when we read God's word, it's mm, 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 mm. Sometimes it's uh-oh. Sometimes you read God's word, and this is what it is. Ouch. This is really going to hurt because Hebrews says that, says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. God's word comes like a surgeon's scalpel, and sometimes we say, this is going to hurt. God's about to do surgery on me, because it's not like a little adjustment I need. I, mean, I need surgery on my soul, on my mouth, on my life, on my mind, and God's got to do a deep work. Can I tell you what? I thank God for those days too. 
when I read his word and, and he does a deep work in me and it says, God, this is gonna hurt. Because just like if you're sick and you go to a doctor and the doctor says, you got a problem, it's a big deal, but if we do surgery, you'll be fine, then you say, thank you for surgery. And sometimes that's what God's doing. Sometimes we read this book and we just go, mm, that's so good. Sometimes we read it and we go, uh-oh, God needs to do an adjustment in my life. Sometimes we go, ouch, this is gonna hurt, but I need what God's gonna do inside of me. And sometimes, we're gonna talk about today, I'm not gonna give you a picture this week, I'm gonna give you two words. Sometimes we just say this. We feel like God says, let's roll. Let's go. It's time to get into action. There's a battle to be fought and an enemy to be faced. And sometimes we read this book and this book puts us on a path where we understand that we need to follow God into battle. And those words became known in our country when a young man named Todd Beamer spoke those words on an airplane on September 11th, 2001. When Todd Beamer got on that airplane that morning, he was going off for business, he had no idea that that would be the last day of his life. He had no idea that on that plane were, were, were a crew and were passengers, but also there were terrorists. He didn't know that. What he did know was Jesus. Todd Beamer walked with Jesus. He grew up in a godly Christian home who taught the word of God to their kids, like we saw in that video today, who taught the word of God to their children. He went to Wheaton College, a great Christian college. He married his college sweetheart. Her name was Lisa. And when he got on that plane that day, they had three children, two out in the world, one still in her womb. But they had three children when he got on that plane. And he got on that plane with the word of God in his heart. That plane was delayed 42 minutes because of traffic on the runways. So by the time they were taking off and climbing to, to, to cruising altitude, there had already been planes that had plunged into the north and the south towers of the Twin Towers. And later on into the Pentagon. And they got word of all of that while they were flying on the plane. The terrorists broke out, pushed them all to the back of the plane. And they're on the back of the plane. And they were on phones calling people. And they found out what was going on. And they realized that basically this, this, their plane they were on was being, being turned into a weapon to crash into another highly populated government location. And so Todd Beamer and nine other passengers and, and two of the, the crew got together and they made a plan that they were gonna storm the cabin and they were gonna make sure that this plane wasn't turned into a flying bomb. And so he made a call trying to reach his wife. He didn't get through, through to his wife. He got through to another person, another woman named Lisa. And, and this woman and a couple of FBI agents talked to him. And while he was talking, when he told them what they were gonna do, he actually said, hey, before we do what we're gonna do, he said, I wanna say the Lord's Prayer. It's recorded. And he said he had the Lord's Prayer committed to memory in his heart. And he asked the people on the phone and the other passengers, if you want to say this, stay with me. When he finished that, he wasn't there. He said, now, now we're going to do the 23rd Psalm. It's a little Bible study. I mean, and they prayed the, 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 the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. And, and, and Todd Beamer's last words, after he actually said, then if I don't make it, please call my family. Let them know I love them. And then he said these words, are you ready? Okay, let's roll. And that plane didn't plunge into another government building and kill thousands of people. It crashed into a field. Those words, let's roll, became this declaration, it's time to go to battle. And when we read this book, there are moments where God says to you and says to me, it's time to go to battle. That habit, that behavior, it's time to fight against it. That injustice in the world, it's time to fight against it. There's time where God says there's a spiritual battle and there is a spiritual battle going on. And there is a real spiritual enemy. If you're not sure about that, if you don't believe that, then, then you don't understand what Jesus says in the word and what the Bible teaches. Here's the reality. Reading, believing, and knowing, and meditating on and speaking the words of the Bible will help us stand strong against the work of the enemy. If you want to stand hard and strong against the work of the enemy in this world, get to know this book. Get it in your heart, get it in your mind, get it on your lips, and let this book get a hold of you and get a hold of your life. In Ephesians chapter six, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter six or on your Bible app, turn, go to Ephesians chapter six. And, and we see this battle painted, this picture of this battle. And as you listen to this passage, as you follow along, as you read along, I want you to notice that in the spiritual battle, there's all kinds of defensive armor, but there's only one weapon that's mentioned. I want you to pay attention to the armor, but also to the weapon and the reality of the battle. Ephesians six, beginning in verse 10. 
Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It's a battle, man. Stand strong. So you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of, the, of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if, it doesn't say if, it says so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You want to stand strong against the enemy. Know this book. Have it in your heart. Have it in your mind. Have it on your lips. And it's not just about owning a Bible. If you say to somebody, well, do you have a Bible? I got a phone. I can pull up all kinds of, you know, I can pull up the whole Bible on my phone. That's great. Do you have a Bible? I I got three or four of them at home. If you gave me half an hour, I could find them, you know? I got, I got a, I got a few, I got a bunch of Bibles. Owning the Bible isn't what prepares you for the Bible. I mean, prepares you for the battle. Owning the Bible is the start. Letting the Bible own your heart and fill your mind and guide your life, that prepares you for the battle. And there is a battle. And we face it every single day. And so so do you know the Bible? Are you feeding on the Bible? Are you growing in God's word? That's why for 10 years, I've been a pastor at Shirley now for 10 years, for 10 years, again and again and again, I call people, get into the word of God, get to know this book. Why? Because one sermon a week isn't enough to empower you and strengthen you to fight against the enemy. It's not. But but you've got God's word. Put it in your heart, put it in your mind, put it in your life. And so here's, here's the deal. We've got to prepare to fight. And the Bible is the greatest weapon against the work of the devil. Your best weapon to stand against the enemy is this book, is the word of God. And if you have your Bibles, turn to to Matthew chapter four. If you have your Bible on your phone, go to Matthew chapter four. And what we see here is this picture that Jesus gave us a perfect example. I mean, Jesus gave us a perfect example of how to fight these battles. And as you listen to Matthew chapter four, as I walk through this, just let God speak to you. Let him speak to your heart. I, I, I picture this, Almost like a a MMA, a mixed martial arts octagon battle between Satan and Jesus. There's a spiritual battle going on, and there's three rounds that take place. And and you you, you you can almost hear the the bell, you know, ding, ding, ding. They come out. And so we read this in Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him, to Jesus, and said, If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now watch Jesus' response. Jesus answered, it is written. And then he quotes from the Old Testament. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Ding, 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 Jesus wins the round. But it's not over yet. They come back out of the corners, ding, ding, ding. Battle continues. Pick it up in verse five. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem. Had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. And now watch as Satan quotes the Bible, trying to manipulate Jesus. He he says, he says, If you throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. stone. Satan says, Jesus, get on the top of the temple, throw yourself down, and before you hit the ground, angels will swoop in because that's what the Bible says. Let me really put on an incredible show, get everyone's attention, it's be really exciting stuff. How does Jesus respond to this deceitful attack? Jesus answered him, it is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Ding, ding, ding. Round two, Jesus wins. The battle's not over yet. They come back out of the corners. Ding, ding, ding. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. 
All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Ding, ding, ding. Jesus wins. But in that battle, I mean, you want to learn how to fight spiritual battles? Watch Jesus. Jesus' response to every temptation of the enemy was, it is written, it is written, it is written. That needs to be our response. And for that to be our response, we have to know this book. We have to know the word of God. We have to be immersed in the word of God. It's got to be in our hearts and our minds. We don't just own the Bible. The Bible owns space in our mind. The Bible owns space in our hearts. The Bible guides us and leads us. Do you know the word of God? Are you ready to fight those battles? Now I could give you a hundred different examples of spiritual battles you're going to face and how God's word can help you fight against them. I want to give you just three examples from scripture and let you hear God's word speak to your heart. And maybe, maybe in one or more of these three examples, you'll say, man, that's the spiritual battle I'm in. I want you to hear how God's word fortifies you, prepares you to fight back. So we've got to prepare to fight. The Bible is the greatest weapon against the work of the devil. And so we've got to understand this, that God's word, it's a strange and surprising weapon. You know, it, when you look at God's word, you go, it's just, it doesn't make sense that this book would be the primary way to fight against the enemy, but it is. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. It's a different kind of battle. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. There is a way that God's word shapes our mind and shapes our hearts and changes us. When I became a Christian, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up in a Christian, I didn't go to church with my friends, family. I didn't, I mean, I, I just didn't have that experience. I didn't know the Bible at all. And when someone gave me the Bible, it began to shape my thinking. And, and I could see so many things that were out of line in my life. And, and this became that, that thing that would help me say, this is how to live. This is how to fight, follow Jesus. This is how to fight the battle. And, and, and that's, that's transformational. And, and so we've got to understand that it, it may seem like a strange, uh, a strange kind of weapon. Excuse me, man. That's a fisherman's friend who never tried them. They're great if, you're, if your voice is scratchy. Um, so, 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 so we've got to now be prepared to fight the battle. If we know it's God's word, then how does this word help us in just the daily battles that we face? So here's three different examples, and maybe you'll see yourself in one of these battles. Here's the first one. When the enemy invites you to be consumed with stuff. When, the enemy loves to let our lives be about the next new toy, the next new experience, more stuff. And being consumed with stuff isn't about whether you're rich or poor. You can have very little and be all about the stuff. You can have a lot and be all about the stuff. You can have very little and be very content and not about the stuff. And you can have a lot and be very content and not about the stuff. But Satan loves when our consuming thought and focus of every day is what about my stuff? How do I get more stuff? How do I take care of my stuff? How do I fix my stuff? How do I expand my stuff? How do I protect my stuff? Satan loves when that's the focus of our life because then our focus is not what matters most. You know what matters most? When the disciples ask Jesus, what's the most important of all things? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that again and again, that what matters most is loving God and loving people and when it's all about the stuff, our lives get out of line. That's a spiritual battle. And so how, do, how does the word of God fight against that? How does God's word correct our thinking? Well, listen to Matthew 6, 25 to 26. And I want to ask you just to listen to God's word. Let God speak to you. If, if you are, if you find yourself at times about stuff and consumed with stuff and we don't have enough stuff or I gotta take in and that's the consuming thought of your mind. Go to God's word and let it speak. You can declare this is written. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothes? 
Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? What's implied is, of course you are. And if God takes care of the sparrows and the birds of the sky, don't you know he'll take care of you? You say, it is written, I have a God who takes care of me. I'm not going to let stuff be the consuming focus of my life. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, the apostle Paul writes this while he's in jail. When someone talks about contentment and they're in jail, they've learned something. And we can learn from them. All right, Philippians 4, beginning in verse 12. The apostle Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. He declares, I can be content. You want to learn contentment? Learn to be content where you are right now. Because if you believe that you're going to be content when you have 5% more, 10% more, twice of what you have, then I'll be content. It's, it's, it's a carrot on a stick. You will never be content if you're not content now. If you can be content right now, then if God gives you more, you're still content. And if God gives you less, you're still content. If you say, I will be content when I get to whatever the marker is, I guarantee you when you get there, the finish line will have moved out of the way. So when that battle is going on about life being about stuff, say, God, teach me, content. it is written, be content where I am now. And then Hebrews 13, five to six, <clears throat> we read this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere people, what can mere mortals do to me? What's the writer of Hebrews saying? What's the spirit of God saying through this? It's saying, listen, God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And so I can say, the Lord is my helper. I'm not afraid. That's my contentment. That's my contentment in who God is and his presence with me. In the spiritual battle over the acquisition and maintenance of stuff, speak the truth of God's word. The point is not to, to say, I'm not gonna work hard or try to achieve things. That's not the point. The point is, where do you find your satisfaction? Where do you find your joy? Where do you find your contentment? And if you find it in Jesus and you're a Christian, guess what? You got it already. And everything else is a bonus. Praise God. That's one area that's a battle for us. And is God's word gonna guide you to the truth? As we prepare to fight with the Bible, God's weapon for us to fight against the enemy, here's another area of battle for a lot of people. When the enemy sows seeds of fear and anxiety, we live in a fear-filled, anxious time with a lot of people who, just, who, who, who deal with anxieties and fears and worries. And some of it's a cultural thing. Some of it's a physiological thing and they've got to figure out their chemical balance. Some of it's, it's, it's a life experiences. They might need a great Christian counselor or a pastor to walk through things. All those are part of the story. But, but the enemy loves to have us be consumed with worry and anxiety all the time. Why? Because that fear and that worry commands all of our time and energy, and we can't give it to the glory of God. There's a spiritual battle there. And we live in a world that keeps feeding us with fear. I think it's the enemy working through all the systems around us to feed us full of fear. You know what most people in America don't know? Most people in America don't know that violent crime in the last decade has gone down in America, not up. But the advertising and the talking about violent crime in the media has gone up, I've heard, as many as times 30 if you're reporting violent crime 30 times more, even if it goes down, what does everybody think? Every, you walk out of the house and someone's going to attack you. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't dangerous people. It doesn't mean that there aren't dangers in the world. But on a national level, violent crime is actually going down, and everyone thinks it's going up. Why? Because that's all that we hear about. And God says, don't let that consume you. Don't let fear and anxiety and worry own you. So you read God's word, and you say, God, speak to me. Help me understand what your word says because I can listen to the narrative of the world or I can listen to you. Here's what God's word says in Philippians 4, verses six to seven. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
You read God's word and it says, don't walk in anxiety. Pray, seek the Lord, trust in him. In John, Jesus says these words. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. That's the words of Jesus. In this world, there's going to be trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Then when fear comes in, you say, it is written, my Jesus has overcome the world. And I belong to him. It is written. I hold to God's word. I trust it. It changes my life. It changes my disposition. In 2 Thessalonians 3.16, we read this. this. This beautiful benediction, this exhortation. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Man, commit that to memory. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace, give me peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. The Lord be with me. Let God's word speak peace and take away anxiety. And yes, Get the help you need. If you need to talk to the pastor, if you need a Christian counselor, if you need to get help from a doctor, do those things. But ultimately, God is the one who wants you to walk in peace and the enemy wants you to walk in anxiety and fear and worry. Fight that battle. And you want to fight it? God's word gives you the truth. Hold to his word. Declare his word. One more example. One more example. As you fight this battle, when the enemy tries to fill you with anger and antagonism, man, I... The, the enemy wants us to be consumed with anger and antagonism toward everyone, anyone. And we live in a time and a culture where, where it, it almost seems sometimes, if you watch the media, you cannot get two people who disagree to actually, what's the word I'm looking for? Talk. Yes, talk. <laughs> you can't even get two people to talk to each other. It's screaming over each other. It's antagonism. It's anger. And we, and, and we watch this and hear this. And we, is, that, you know, is it even possible to disagree with somebody and still love them? Is it possible to say, I totally disagree with where you stand and what you believe, but I love you and I'll treat you with grace and kindness? Is that possible? Well, not only is that possible, it's what Jesus wants. It's what Christians are supposed to do, right? And if we don't do it, if we don't get this, can I tell you right now, if we don't get this, no one's getting this. Because it's the power of the Holy Spirit in us that allows us to look at someone and say, I disagree and I stand against what you stand for, but I will show love to you. How can I say this? How can I say that that's the way to live, and that the enemy is the one who wants us to feel antagonistic and angry and hateful towards all kinds of people. Well, listen to these words from Luke chapter 6. This is Jesus, our Lord, speaking. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. How countercultural is that? Right? And, 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 and then it goes on. Look at the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 14 to 19. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This is tough stuff. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Oh, you did that? Oh, I'm bringing the fire, man. I'm bringing it back on you. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. God's not saying people won't get what's coming to them. God's saying, let me handle that. But you show grace. Colossians 3, 12 to 14 says this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, this is to the church, to God's people. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is for you. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Wow. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Undeserved forgiveness. That's just hard to comprehend. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
And I could give you a lot more examples of places where it's a spiritual battle. Man, a spiritual battle that, that wants to be consumed with stuff instead of consumed with the glory of God. A spiritual battle that wants us to be filled with anxiety and worry and fear and not walk in peace. A spiritual battle that wants us to be antagonistic and mean-spirited and angry rather than show the love and the grace of Jesus. If you're going to fight these battles and win, you better know this word, and this word better be in your heart. Grow in this word and know this word. I became a Christian over 40 years ago, and I've been reading this book for all 40 years. And yesterday morning when I got up and opened this book to read it, God showed me fresh new things I hadn't seen before. And I don't know when I open this book what's going to happen. It might be sweet as honey. It might be some instruction to get my life back on track. I go, uh-oh, better get it right. It might be, oh, this is going to hurt. It might be God saying with a scalpel, I'm going to do a deep work in you. It might be God equipping me and preparing me for the battle I don't even know is coming, but it's right down the road. But I know this. Every time I open this book, because the Spirit of God lives in me, and the Spirit of God inspired this book, man, something's going to happen. Every time I, I, I plug in my phone and turn on scripture when I'm driving and I listen to the word of God, something's gonna happen. And so I wanna ask you today, I'm gonna invite people to pray in two ways today. And I'm gonna ask for people to make one of two commitments. The first is this. If you know you're a Christian, and, and, and you know you're a Christian, here's the simple story of Jesus. You know you're a Christian. If you understand that there is a God who loves you even though you don't deserve it, you understand that your wrongs and your sins have separated you from God and you can't get your way back home again, but you understand that God came to this world, Jesus Christ, God with us. He lived a perfect life with no wrong. He died on the cross for your wrongs and mine. He was buried for three days and he rose again. And you have received the grace of Jesus. You've called him your savior and you've chosen to follow him with your life and you become his follower. If that's the case, you're a Christian. So if you're a Christian and you say today, I want to know God's word more. I want to open this book more often and see what God's going to do in me and through me. Let's just quiet our hearts. Let's just bow our heads for a minute. And I want to give you a moment. If you're a follower of Jesus and you've come to the cross and you've received his grace and you are saying today, and in the worship center, this is in the family worship venue and online at home. If you're at home online, I want you to do the same thing right now. Will you, if you want to say to God right now, God, I want to know your word more and I'm going to seek to read it more and follow it more closely. And that's your prayer. I want to pray for you about that. Just raise your hand and raise it high. If you say, I want to know this word more. I want to see what God's going to do in me. I want to say, God, I'm going to open this book and say, Spirit of God, do something amazing because you live in me and you've inspired. Keep your, your hand high. Almost, almost turn it like, or up, like, up to the heaven like you're going to receive as I pray. Lord God, we, we raise, Lord, I raise my hand. We raise our hand high to heaven here in the family worship venue, even folks at home. And we're saying, God, we want to know your word. God, you've spoken your truth. In this world where everything seems to be relativistic with nothing that's true, your word is the ultimate truth. So we are saying, God, give us the strength every day for three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, a half an hour, whatever it is, to listen to your word as we drive along, to put it in, in our minds, to reopen the Bible, to read it, to, to say, God, work in me. And God, every time we open the word, do what you want to do. Do something new in us. Lord, comfort us, encourage us, and make it sweet as honey. Lord, correct us and guide us and, and show us how to live our lives. Lord, even if you have to do that deep work of spiritual surgery, if there's something you want to do in us, we say, God, do what you will do. God, prepare us for the battles that are out there, that we can say, it is written. We raise our hand and say, oh God, I commit to know you more as I read your word. Empower me and work in me through your word. And if that's your prayer, say amen. 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 Put your hands down. And now let's just keep our heads bowed. And for those of you that would say today, I'm not yet a follower of Jesus. So I don't have that Holy Spirit of God. However that works, the Spirit of God's not living in me yet. So I can read this book, but it's not having that power because I've not said yes to Jesus. Then maybe today's the day you need to say, Jesus, I recognize that you love me, that I've wronged you with my sins and my wrongs, and I want to today, I want to confess my sins to you. And I want to ask for your forgiveness. And I want to ask your Holy Spirit to move in my life and do what you want to do in me. I want to take your hand and follow you all the days of my life. If you want me to lead you in a prayer right now for you to say yes to Jesus for the first time and to invite the Spirit of God to move in you 
And along with that, say, then I'm gonna walk with Jesus. If you're ready to make that commitment today, I wanna pray for you. Would you raise your hand and raise it high up in the air so I can see it? I just wanna see if, you, as I pray for you, I wanna know who I'm praying for. In the family worship venue, will you raise your hand in the family worship venue? And online, uh, I want you to send a note into us online and let us know that you're raising your hand right now. So keep that hand up high there, I wanna see. So, okay, I see two of you right next to each other up in the balcony there. Okay, so keep that hand up. I wanna pray for you in a minute. Anybody else? And over here, do it high. So I, okay, over here on the far side, look, over, look up at me over here. I see you got your hand up over there. Yeah, okay, good. I want to pray for you. Anybody else? Okay, right there. Fantastic. Keep that hand up in the air. Just, you're saying to God, I'm, I'm ready to make that. So, okay, right there in the balcony with the white sweater. Good. Okay, anybody else? I want to move to prayer quickly. So if you have your hand up, I'm not seeing you kind of wave it around. Okay, over here. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. And, if, and this morning in the first service, three people, I, oh, right here in the very front of the balcony over there. Look up, look up at me real quick there. Okay, good. Um, in the first service, three people didn't raise their, two people didn't raise their hands, but they came up afterwards, and you can do that too. But keep your hand up in the air. I'm gonna pray for you right now. Lord, there are people around the worship center, people in the family worship venue, and the people at home. Lord, I know there's always 100 to 200 people watching the service online. Lord, for anyone that has their hand raised up right now, Lord, they are saying to you, God, I've, I've never received Jesus before, but right now I say, Jesus, I thank you for your love, oh God. I thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins, for my wrong, and I accept you this day. And Spirit of God, now move into my life. Remind me that I am forgiven, that I am loved by God, and help me start on this journey of growing and walking with Jesus. I confess my sins. I receive Jesus as the one who will save me from my sins, and also I take your hand, Jesus, as the one who will lead my life. And I raise my hand to say, Jesus, I am yours. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen, amen. Can we give praise to God this morning? Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how honored and humbled I am that I get to be a pastor and a pastor here at Shoreline. This is such an honor. Before, I want to give you a word of blessing as I send you out. Before I ask you to stand for a word of blessing, just stay, stay where you are for about 30 seconds, and I want to give you a couple quick invitations. If you've never become a member of Shoreline and you want to know more about joining, you don't have to join the church. If you want to know more about joining the church, I'm doing a class at 1 o'clock today in the Peninsula Room right through the lobby here, and you can come and join me for that class at 1 o'clock and hear about the life of Shoreline Church. So I invite you to come be part of that this Wednesday night, you will want to be right here in the worship center. We got dinner at 5 o'clock in the Parkside Room, 615, night of worship. It's once a month. We're going to have communion together. We're going to sing. We're going to study God's word, and God's going to show up. It's going to be powerful. So if you can be here at 615 on Wednesday, you'll love it. It'll be a great time. This Saturday is our marriage uh, Saturday with Gary, uh, Gary Thomas coming, our Cherish Saturday. If you haven't registered yet, I think we have about 600 people that have registered. We have room for about 150 or 200 more, but we have to order lunches. And so please, if you're gonna register, go to the lob uh, through the lobby, the Connection Center, and register right after the service so we can make sure we have the right count for lunches for that event. If you need prayer for anything at all, come forward for prayer. The team will pray with you. If you're new at Shoreline, go by the Connection Center, and they wanna give you a gift and a special welcome right after the service. And if you raised your hand, I want to invite you to do one thing. If, will you come forward and join my wife, Sherry, and I right here for about four or five minutes? If you have kids in programming, that's okay. They'll keep taking care of them for a few minutes. Come forward, and we want to give you a Bible and pray with you and celebrate with you and talk about how you can take some next steps of growing because the next step is to begin walking with Jesus. So if you raise your hand, please give us four or five minutes and come forward, all right? Let's stand together as I give a word of blessing. If you're in the family worship venue, come right over here and meet Sherry and I right here in the front of the worship center. It's only about one minute away. You can make it over here after I give the blessing, all right? As you go from this place, Go knowing that if you've received Jesus Christ, the spirit of the living God lives in you. So read his book, his spirit-inspired book, and let God do something in and through you every single day. Delight when it's as sweet as honey. Respond when God calls you to change. Embrace if he's got to do surgery and change something big. And equip yourself to stand strong in the name of Jesus against the lies of the enemy. For the glory of Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. If you raise your hand, come forward for prayer with Sherry and I. And 615, Night of Worship Wednesday. God bless you. Have a great day.